Welcome to our first uh, commentary of, of 2019. Um, obviously, these are interesting and challenging times for trying to path out the trajectory of the Irish economy, um, both in, in the short term, um, but also in the longer term, thinking about the, the potential uh, changes that could be uh, on the horizon. So um, what we're doing um, in this particular commentary, obviously, uh, you'll have all seen the, the, the very detailed um, and thorough study that was released by our colleagues this morning, um, charting out the longer term impacts of Brexit, Brexit on the Irish economy. What, what we're doing in this particular uh, uh, QEC is to try and do two things. One, um, we map out a kind of baseline case where Brexit occurs, but that there is a transitionary arrangement where the UK uh, uh, maintains, you know, to a certain extent, the, the current relationship that it has with the EU. And we'll map out kind of where we see the Irish economy going under that particular scenario. And we look through the domestic economy, monetary financial conditions, um, the housing market, public finances, as, as we, we normally do. And then we're, what we're going to try and do is we leverage on the research uh, that was done on the longer term impacts and try and scope out what we think would be the, the potential short-run path for the Irish economy under the various um, Brexit scenarios that are, are, are presented in that particular piece of research. And our colleagues here, Adele and co-authors, are here to answer any of your, your easy questions on the, the, the Brexit study released today. So we, we appreciate them attending. And then we, we'll, we'll wrap up and c conclude. So um, notwithstanding the... The, 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 the short-term uncertainties around Brexit, you know, we, we expect the Irish economy to grow uh, reasonably robustly this year. Um, it, we're, our forecast growth rate for 2019 is 3.8% and uh, we're slowing uh, moderately next year to 3.2%. Um, this is a, a reduction in the growth outlook since uh, quarter four 2018, since our previous commentary. Uh, we, we were forecasting 4.2% uh, for, for, for this year. The main reason we've, we've moderated um, the, the growth outlook is the deterioration in the global economy, the particular the, 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 the sluggishness um, coming through both in the US side, uh, in, in, in the European economy, and in broader emerging markets where the, the, the growth outlook has been moderated downwards, particularly around the, the, the slower international trade outlook. So th this is the main reason why we're, we're pulling down our forecasts slightly from, uh, from, from the, the previous commentary. In terms of the labour market, uh, you know, we, we do expect still robust growth uh, in the labour market um, under this baseline scenario. You know, um, expect employment to reach uh, about th uh, 2.3 million this year uh, and, and up in 2020 by another 50,000 uh, on, on top of that. For 2019, we expect an average unemployment rate of about 5.2%. So tipping down slightly on what the rates we've seen in the market or in the, in the labour market. Uh, at present, it's February numbers stood at about 5.6%. We see that continuing to, to, to decline moderately this year. And then for 2020, we see it break the 5% barrier. We're expecting the full-year unemployment rate in 2020 to be 4.8%. Uh, uh, in terms of the, the public finances, um, notwithstanding the fact that we, we, we technically got a a small surplus last year, um, mainly around the, 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 the big increase in corporation tax receipts. We, we expect a, a, a government deficit this year and, and, and next year, and we, we'll chart that out in a little bit more detail. Uh, obviously, given the, the, the growth rates um, are, are reasonably high, certainly in the European context, the, the debt to GDP ratio is continuing to fall uh, in 2019 and, and below, 20, 20, uh, below 60% in 2020. Okay, so let me just talk uh, a little bit more specific about the, the specific items uh, that make up the growth forecasts. Um, so uh, first of all, if we look at consumption, this is obviously the, the, the first time we've, we were forecast in 2020, but we see uh, quite a decline uh, in consumption growth between 2018 and 2019, where full year uh, forecast for 2018 um, was about 3%. We're pulling that down to about 2.3%. Obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll show some, some figures now in a minute, but a couple of the indicators have been suggesting that, particularly the household sector, is, is uh, beginning 
to, to, to moderate consumption spending, particularly some sluggishness in retail sales. Also, also our consumer sentiment indices have been have been uh, declining in recent months. So we're pulling consumption down to about 2.3% this year, and then a slight moderation again next year. In terms of uh, the net current government spending, and um, we see it being maintained this year uh, at the same level as, as, as 2018, and then coming down uh, slightly into into 2020. Uh, in terms of the investment position, um, it's noteworthy, I'll, I'll show some charts in a second, that the investment rate has been, uh, the, the growth in the investment rate has been slowing um, towards the end of last year, particularly uh, in terms of machinery and equipment. And we expect, uh, given the, the, both the, the, the near-term uncertainties and the, the broader global factors, we do see a moderation in the investment rate this year. But then a slight pickup next year, in particular around where there's still strong housing investment in, in, in new dwellings. And then really where we have moderated our forecasts uh, this year is the slower trade uh, balance contribution to the Irish economy. Particularly, we, we've, we've yeah, cut quite considerably our, our export forecast. And the, uh, in particular, tw 2019 and 2020, we have exports growing faster than imports in both years. And that means that the, the contribution of the trade balance to growth is, is falling in both years, leading to GDP forecast of 3.8% this year and coming down to 3.2% uh, next year on the, the, the further trade deterioration. <clears throat> okay, so, so more specifically about consumption, you can see the, on the blue line, which presents the year-on-year -year growth rate in, the, in, in uh, personal consumption um, on constant price basis, you can see that there was a pickup uh, in, in, in 2017, but since mid-2018, there has been a reduction in the annualised growth rate in, in, in consumption spending. And then when we couple that with the slowdown we're seeing in the retail sales, and also the fact that our consumer sentiment index really has fallen off cliff for the first couple of months of, of 2019, we do expect uh, quite a considerable slowdown in the rate of growth of consumption spending, which had been one of the, the major contributory factors uh, to, the, to the very robust uh, robust um, recovery in, in the 15, 16, 17 period. Again, notwithstanding, you know, we talk a little bit about uh, the specific Brexit scenarios um, uh, later on, but in terms of consumer sentiment, it is, is certainly a major contributing factor that the, the, the generalised uncertainty is pulling down the consumer sentiment uh, at present. And that is very clear from the monthly indices that we've been producing over the, the, the start of, of 20, uh, 2019. In terms of the investment spending, uh, obviously we're presenting two figures here. The blue line is the uh, overall investment uh, level. The red line is the, the modified figures uh, that CSO produce. The modified strips out the investment, the aircraft leasing, and the um, R&D related intangible assets. So it's much more related to the real economy activity in Ireland. And you can see since the end of, of um, of, of, of 2017 into 2018, there has been a moderation in the rate of growth of investment. Um, and that's particularly noteworthy given the level of uncertainty at present uh, in the Irish economy. Obviously, a big globalised uh, you know, uh, sector in the Irish economy, uh, the FDI contribution to investment is, is considerable. So to really understand what's happening at a granular level, un underneath the investment rate, we need to split it down by the type of assets that companies are investing in. So what we're presenting here splits out the overall investment rate by uh, the different asset types, so there's the intangibles, the machinery, equipment, and the building and constructions. And what this chart provides is a four-month rolling average, so it kind of gives us a smoother trend over time in what the direction of travel is underneath the, the investment series. And what you can actually see is that uh, the Machinery equipment, which is a good guide for investment by, you know, in, in by firms in real things that they need for their business on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that has been slipping down uh, in the past number of quarters. Interestingly, in the in the very last quarter, I was uh, interested to note this at the the CSO release uh, the past couple of weeks, is that building and construction has moderated slightly, uh, in particular around the improvements um, and investment in, in in other building construction, which is the the, um, the commercial investment aspect. So th these are all uh, pointing towards uh, a, a slower uh, 
uh, domestic economy uh, uh, towards the end of last year. So, uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the, the broader investment picture, the labour market has continued in, in 2018 in, into the first couple of months of this year to show uh, quite a deal of robustness. Um, the un unemployment rate stood at about 5.6% in February, and we're expecting that to kind of bottom out this year at about 5.2%, so to, to, to slowly uh, decline throughout the year uh, in line with the, the generalised um, growth in the, in the economy. Then we, we, we're, we're forecasting it to, to come under the 5% mark uh, in, in 2020 to 4.8%. Um, looking at the overall level of employment, uh, we're, we're forecasting it up to, to increase by 2.5% in 2019 and then by 2% 2 in 2020. This is coupled with, you know, reasonable growth in, in the overall labour force. One of the things we, we, we uh, noted quite, which was quite dramatic last year, was the big increase in net inward migration uh, in the 2018 numbers, and we're expecting that to, to continue, um, which gives us a, a decent chunk of growth in the, in the, in the overall labour force. In terms of earnings, um, in our last commentary, we were, we were pointing out uh, the fact that you know, with, with the decline in the unemployment rate and the, the growth in the domestic economy, it's likely that there will be upward pressure on, on earnings. And in, in quarter four 2018, we did see uh, quite considerable growth year on year in, in terms of earnings. And we're forecasting that to be at 3.2% for the full year this year and 3.4% uh, next year as the labour market continues uh, to tighten. In terms of the overall inflationary environment, obviously the, the, the um, exchange rate position and the low oil prices should... Uh, and the, coupled with the weakness in the European economy, uh, notwithstanding Brexit, we, 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 we feel that the inflationary uh, pressures, uh, other than the, the earnings forecasts, would, should be reasonably low. Um, in terms of the broader monetary and financial position, um, again, 2018 saw quite robust uh, new lending growth in the mortgage market. You know, it was up uh, nearly 20% uh, uh, in, in value terms. That was about uh, just over 8 billion in, in new lending, about 40,000 new loans uh, last year, which is up from 32,000 new loans the year before. So again, the mortgage market expanded uh, quite considerably last year. One of the things we, we have uh, included in the commentary is a review of, of, of the level of new lending as a share of disposable income, trying to uh, use that as a potential measure of, of the build-up of systemic risk or, or the types of risks that could accumulate in the mortgage market. And uh, what we saw was for the full year 2018 that it, the, the new lending accounted for about 10% of, of personal disposable income, which is down very, very considerably on, on the, the figures that are going out uh, during the boom period. Um, so uh, coupled with the fact that the type of loans that are going out now covered by the macro potential framework and a much more... Uh, much better underwriting practices on the banking side suggests that the, the, the new lending uh, activity is, is much more uh, is much more uh, sustainable in terms of, of, the, of the, the credit risks um, than, than in the past. In terms of the SME lending activity, um, again there was there was uh, uh, about eight percent growth in, in, in total new lending to SMEs last year. Um, on an annualised basis. However, one of the things we, we have noted since, uh, since the Brexit vote is that the rejection rate for new SME lending applications is higher than the European median by, by quite a, a considerable amount for, for term loans, which suggests some, some increase in the tightness in, in SME credit supply uh, relative to our European peers. Obviously, uh, the recent announcements by the, the European Central Bank, given the economic uncertainty more broadly in Europe, suggests that any policy rate normalisation is, is off the cards in the, in the near term, certainly pushed out to 2020. Um, but again, interest rates in Ireland are higher than their European peers. We've been saying that for a while, and that can, continues, and that's uh, due to a number of factors, credit risk and competition uh, and so forth. And certainly, uh, uh, th this presents... Uh, a challenge in terms of the investment activity of households and, and firms. Okay, let me hand over to Kieran now who's going to talk through housing market, uh, public finances and external environment. So on the housing market, I think what we observe, as Connor's kind of alluded to there, I suppose, in terms of the, uh, 
the, the overall monetary and financial position, you, you still see strong growth in terms of lending. Uh, the volume of mortgage drawdowns up 15%. We also see quite a pickup, I suppose, in the rate of housing activity. So completions increasing by 25% in 2018. So I think somewhere in the region of just over 18,000 units. Our expectation for this year is it'll be somewhere just less than 24,000. Uh, and then in 2020, we think housing supply could start to push up towards uh, near enough to the 30,000 mark, so around 20,000 in particular. Um, what we are seeing is, whilst prices are continuing to increase and rents are continuing to increase, there's no doubt that there is a, a deceleration, if you like, in the growth rate. Interestingly enough, um, house prices to date, year on year, are up 5.6%. We did an exercise actually this time last year at a conference where we were forecasting prices, and we expected prices to grow by somewhere in the region of 6% this year. So I think what you are seeing is that prices are, you know, the increase in house prices is more reflective now of what's going on in the underlying economy. They're being driven more and more by fundamental prices than maybe in the past where you had a kind of an element of correction or catch up, if you like, given the very strong or very significant price falls which we experienced after 2007. So I think, uh, you know, now prices reflecting or the increase in prices reflecting more underlying developments in the economy. And that's, I suppose, a, a much a better position to be in uh, than a situation where you have very, very strong price growth. That's just the overall year-on-year -year price trends. And as I said, you can see the very strong growth from 2012 onwards, uh, both for uh, the national position and for Dublin. But you can clearly see uh, the latter half of 2018, the rate of price increases beginning to moderate down from double digits down to, as I said, 5.5%. Five, five On the public finances, and, and I think this is quite an important issue, um, you know, the, the, the headline position was quite positive in 2018. We saw a mild surplus for the first time, I think, since 2007. Uh, that's a, a very positive development, I suppose, given the pace of growth, particularly of the economy. But I think underpinning it is the fact that we've had very, very strong, much stronger than expected, increases in corporation tax uh, in particular. Uh, so last year, corporation taxes grew by 24%. If corporation taxes had grown in line with what the Department of Finance expected them to grow at the start of 2018, um, you would have actually had a deficit last year of just a, a minor deficit of 0.1%. But what that shows is just this nature of, of, of this windfall taxes uh, concept, if you like. So we did a simple exercise in the commentary where we went back and looked at the difference between what the department was forecasting for corporation tax receipts and what actually transpired between 2013 and 2018. And there was a difference, if you like, a positive difference overall of five and a half billion. So that's five and a half billion more in corporation tax receipts than what the department were forecasting at the outset of each of those years. Uh, accumulated, if you like, taking the, the, the entire sum. So that's a sizable kind of windfall tax uh, receipt. Um, and I think in, in the commentary we talk about, you know, how, how what we may need to think about doing with these receipts, whether uh, we, we, we pump it into the rainy day fund or whether we divert it totally to capital-based projects. But again, certainly if we're to learn the lessons of the past, uh, those kind of windfall receipts shouldn't be used for current, uh, to fund current expenditure or, in, or increases in current expenditure. Overall then, uh, because we had that sizable surge in corporation tax in 2018, uh, this year we think we're going to slip back into a, a minor deficit position of 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 next year. That's on the foot of you know, fairly sizable um, uh, increases, uh, expected increases in public expenditure uh, envisaged over those two years, notwithstanding the strong growth rates. Overall then, the, the debt to GDP, as Connor outlined at the start, is improving, so down 63% in 2019 falling to 58% in 2020, but I suppose if we were to look at it in the context of GNI star, which is more reflective, I suppose, of underlying economic activity, we're still at 103% in 2019 and falling to 95.5% uh, next year. So certainly an improvement, um, uh, particularly, I suppose, in relation to the debt to GDP, improvement in the GNI star, debt to GNI star, but still quite high uh, by European standards. Um, and so again, I suppose the point we're, we're, we're anxious to make is you know the, the, the fact that the corporation tax receipts have been growing so strongly. Um, now, many will point to, uh, you know, the CSO will point to the fact that, you know, undoubtedly an element of the increase in corporation tax is due to the increased profitability of firms, uh, multinational firms that are located here. But there's also obviously some other activity going on that none of us are particularly able to, 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 to precisely quantify. But that is having an impact, obviously, on the overall receipt levels. Um, and uh, again, just from a fiscal sustainability point of view going forward, again, the lessons of the past are certainly that we shouldn't be funding current expenditure 
out of increases in, in the windfall element of these, of these taxation receipts uh, because of the, the, the significant difficulties which arose in the past when that kind of policy was pursued. Uh, the external environment, I mean, the reason why we're, we're seeing a, a modification of our growth rate under the baseline scenario, again, with the, the UK pretty much, uh, our, our technical assumption being the UK maintaining its present relationship with the European Union, is because of the slowdown that we observe globally, particularly, I suppose, the US growth rate, but more particularly, I suppose, in, more, um, in, in the more immediate uh, vicinity, you see the growth rate uh, or the recovery in the euro area has certainly moderated significantly over the last six months. Um, I've done some work with, with a colleague Carl Whelan where we've looked at uh, you know, European growth rates over the more longer term and I suppose we've been pointing out that we feel there's difficulties there with the growth rate for Europe over the longer term due to issues concerning demographics and productivity. So not, we're not entirely surprised that the kind of cyclical recovery that we've observed in the euro area hasn't been as strong as maybe what other commentators would have expected. But nonetheless, that slowdown coupled with the US, the UK, irrespective of Brexit has, or maybe because of Brexit has been experiencing a slowdown, that's all that is to moderate uh, somewhat our, 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 our expectation, growth expectation. This is just a nice graph identifying the difference or the contribution of things like merchand merchanding and uh, contract manufacturing to our trade statistics. So it's basically comparing the headline trade statistics in the dark blue with uh, the cross-border um, cross statistics, which essentially don't include things like merchanding and, mer and uh, contract manufacturing. So you can see how the presence of contract manufacturing and merchanting can lead to quite a significant difference in terms of the overall headline position as far as the trade situation is concerned. Okay, so what we do in this exercise is we try and take the, the work that uh, Connor mentioned at the outset, the work that our colleagues uh, have done that you see uh, published today, um, which is essentially taking the, the uh, impacts of Brexit and trying, and, and their analysis is very much looking at the, the impacts over a 10-year horizon. And I'm sure my colleagues would say that that is the, the most appropriate and optimal way to look at these issues. Um, so we are taking a bit of a jump trying to, if you like, bring it forward just into the immediate short-term outlook, but obviously it's something that w obviously we have to address. So it's basically taking the longer-term analysis. So on the left-hand side, you can see the percentage deviation from baseline under the kind of the, the different scenarios, uh, the withdrawal agreement, um, the a no deal, a, a kind of an, an orderly no deal, if you like, and then the last scenario is this disorderly no deal. And so this is the impact that the percentage deviation from baseline GDP uh, over uh, over a 10-year horizon. Okay, uh, the baseline is obviously the UK stays within the European Union, and so obviously and, and, and not surprisingly. Uh, the biggest and most adverse impact is for the disorderly exit, uh, a no deal disorderly exit, uh, where uh, Irish GDP is 5% lower than what it w otherwise would be um, in, in, in that particular scenario. Um, this kind of, I suppose, just focusing on the results in 10 years' time doesn't capture the fact and a lot of the analysis that Adele, Nabian, and Philip have, been, have undertaken is trying to capture. Uh, you, you know, the, 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 the disorderly element, so they've tried to front load a lot of the adjustment that does take place because obviously under a disorderly exit, a lot of the, the kind of the adjustment takes place in the short to medium term as opposed to over the longer term. So what we do then on the right hand side is we try and translate the longer term results into the shorter term outlook in terms of how we see uh, GDP evolving over the next two years under these types of scenarios. And in particular, we focus on the disorderly exit because this is obviously the one that has the most potentially adverse implication for the Irish economy. And so in 2019, our headline, our baseline GDP forecast, as Connor outlined, is 3.8% for 2019, 3.2% for next year. Under a disorderly uh, exit, you see uh, we expect GDP to grow by just 1.2% this year. So if uh, we, we do, or if, if, if the, the, the UK does exit in a disorderly fashion after the 12th of April, uh, we expect to see Irish GDP grow by 1.2% this year and 2.4% next year. Um, obviously, if that is pushed out a little bit, so if it you know, ends up being May or even June, then the, the chances are that 1.2% will be, you know, won't be as, it, it won't be as significant. Um, so you'll have a more benign effect in the present year and maybe pushing the, 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 the more adverse implications into next year. So instead of maybe 1.2%, it might be growing at 1.5 or 1.8% this year, but then maybe growing at only 2 or 2.2% 2 .2 next year. So it, a lot depends on the timing. 
But in a sense, as you can see, overall, um, you know, quite a significant a disorderly uh, uh, Brexit um, would have quite a significant impact on, on the growth outlook for this year uh, and for next year. Okay, so general assessment then. Uh, you know, in the baseline context, we still see uh, the economy growing quite significantly. Obviously, the headline figure last year was 6.7%. That does include a lot of multinational relation, uh, related activity. So I suppose our feeling would be that the economy, if you like, in underlying terms, probably grew somewhere in the region of 45 to 5% last year. Uh, if you were able to strip out all of the kind of the, 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 the distortionary activity related to some of the multinational behavior. Um, so our outlook this year is certainly down in that. We believe the economy growing at less than 4% this year. That's still quite strong though, and it still, I suppose, reflects the fact that consumption and modified investment are growing quite strongly in the economy. Um, the reason for the, mod the modification, the growth modification under the baseline is because of this observed slowdown in global terms, and that obviously has a, a significant impact uh, on a small open economy like ourselves. Obviously this year is heightened levels of uncertainty because of the global situation, but obviously because of the, the, the uncertainty around Brexit. Uh, and um, yeah, as I just said, uh, under a disorderly Brexit, the most adverse scenario, we see growth only increasing this year by just over 1%. Public finances, as I said, the issue of the windfall tax issue I think is, is important. Um, certainly has important budgetary implications um, and I think it's important that we all, you know, identify and, and, and as far as we can, and we, we, we did some work in the past where we sought to quant quantify the windfall tax issue from the housing market, uh, and that was obviously at the root of a lot of our difficulties back uh, in the post-2007 era, but certainly I think we need to continue doing that work, and even from a surveillance point of view, it's, it's important uh, that we would focus on the, the, uh, the emergence of and trying as far as, and so far as is possible to quantify the windfall tax component, particularly in, in relation to corporation taxes, uh, and that should you know, in, ensure greater and most, more sustained kind of fiscal planning over the short to medium term.